Hello, welcome to Citizens Forum. It's Wednesday, October the 11th. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking the volunteer crew and the Shaw staff that makes this program happen. And Walt is away, so it's me and me alone, except with John. And uh, we're going to start off by talking about the Federal Appeals Court case, which, as I mentioned earlier, I don't know anything about. Well, it's a, it's a case that's before the Appeals Court, the Federal Appeals Court, and it's about Kinder Morgan. And uh, 17 applicants are in court uh, trying to get the approval of Kinder Morgan uh, reversed. And this is in Vancouver? I imagine it's in Vancouver. Pretty sure it's in Vancouver. And um, it's happening now? Well, it happened last, started last week, and it's continuing to uh, the end of this week, as far as I know. About two weeks could go a bit longer. Yeah, really, I kind of missed it. I, I, I don't want to miss it. Um, if you ask me anything about the Vancouver Canucks or the Toronto Maple Leafs, that seems to be all over the TV. But I would be, I would like to know about this, and I'm, I'm kind okay, of well, horrified that I don't. So plug in Globe and Mail online. Yeah, there it is. It Vancouver is there, Sun. but, but. But what? Well, look at the coverage given to the killings in Las Vegas. I mean, that's a horrible crime. But compare that to this particular trial, which is happening in, we oh, don't do even I know. Think, I agree. If it bleeds, it leads, gets way too much prominence. I find myself, when I'm watching some news programs, I, I PVR it, you know, personal video recorder, and then I usually end up going, flashing through the first 10, 15 minutes because if it bleeds, it leads, and there's hurricanes and all sorts of stuff that I'm not interested in. But meanwhile, back in Vancouver, they're having this two-week court case. And um, also in, in the courtroom, being able to speak, will be um, the uh, NDP government of Alberta uh, and the NDP government of British Columbia. They're both there as interveners as, an, as opposed to applicants. The difference, don't ask me. But they get to have their say in court. Obviously, the uh, Alberta uh, interveners will, <coughs> will be arguing in favor of uh, Kinder Morgan and the uh, BC government will be um, arguing against it. What caught my attention recently was the um, there's some research being done up at the University of Victoria into solving or at least addressing complex social issues, complex public issues, public problems like climate change, like poverty, like income inequality, like you know watershed management. You get into areas of the planet where they're prone to drought in the off season. And you know, there's river systems and watershed systems where like about four or five different countries are involved. And um, what the research suggests is that um, these are very complex problems, they're not solved overnight, and it requires a tremendous amount of collaboration, it, it requires a tremendous amount of innovation. And the one that caught my eye was the notion that it requires unlikely allies coming together to uh, come to a, a decision. And in my opinion, I'm biased, but in my opinion, you know, two unlikely allies are uh, the Prime Minister trying to put into place a, uh, uh, you know, an accord on clean growth and climate change, and a, uh, an Alberta Premier insisting on uh, doubling or tripling a, doubling a, uh, expanding an existing pipeline to carry Dilbit to the coast, diluted bitumen to the coast here in, uh, on the, in uh, BC. And um, so part of their deal making and, uh, was to agree on Kinder Morgan. And in return, uh, Alberta would cut back on its uh, you know, largely coal-fired uh, electricity. They would put a cap on the, uh, on the, uh, greenhouse, on the, the greenhouse gas emissions coming out of the oil sands. And again, it caught my, it caught my attention because uh, that degree of collaboration, the coming, the coming together of unlikely allies, doesn't happen in court. So I'm concerned that when you go to court, so much disappears. There's winners and there's losers. And what happens is often that the losers, it's, a game, it's like a game of whack-a-mole, right? So you whack down the Kinder Morgan and you think, I've got the problem solved. Poof, up pops another problem over here, like a whole, uh, you know, a large increase in, uh, in railway cars filled with uh, diluted bitumen making their way to the coast. Okay, so that's, 
like I say, it's, it's whack-a-mole. And you don't, you don't solve those kinds of problems in court. I do think that maybe a solution to the Kinder Morgan problem is coming along. Um, because I think this is Wednesday, October the 11th. California is ablaze. So um, Puerto Rico is a disaster. Florida was flooded. The citrus industry in Florida is gone. Right? Not, not this year's crop. They think the industry is gone. Nothing in the media about that. And Houston was flooded, and uh, you know I'm sure uh, it's not rebuilt yet, or even well on its way for thousands and thousands of people. So I think the future of fossil fuels uh, is limited. Is limited. And we have to transition to a low carbon economy as quickly as possible. And it's that transitioning, again, that caught my attention with, uh, with uh, Premier Notley and uh, you know, the Prime Minister in the sense that uh, what they accomplished outside of court um, is going to be undone and maybe get maybe undone in court. But then again, there's nothing to, uh, to uh, take its place in the sense that they're going to have to maybe sit down again and, you know, uh, come together and uh, find an alternative solution. My concern, though, as I said, is that you knock down the mole in the whack-a-mole and, you know, all of a sudden Dilbert-laden uh, railway cars pour in. But I'm more concerned about the much larger uh, kind, of con uh, kind of context, which is, oh, all of a sudden, you know, Rachel Notley loses her pipeline to Kinder Morgan or to the West Coast and she's gone in the next election and in comes Jason Kenney. Jason Kenney is no friend to addressing the very issues that you're talking about in terms of, you know, out of control climate change. He's not I don't think he, you know, he I'm not saying he's a denier, but I don't think that's the high on his priority. Or again, uh the Prime Minister begins to uh get into a weakened position and all of a sudden you have a Prime Minister Andrew Scheer, right? And uh, that's, that's going to take us further away from transitioning to a low carbon economy. Yeah. I see it differently. I see more the oil industry runs the country and Jason Kenney and Rachel Notley and John Horgan and Trudeau and Harper. You make no difference between them. Yeah, they're, they're all the same. They're all controlled from above. So Horgan, Notley, Prime Minister, Andrew Scheer, and Jason Kenney, they're all, they all do what they're told. And there's no difference? Yes. So, the, I'll so say that. a vote for, so it doesn't matter how you vote? Basically. And now, I'm not saying I'm right. That's just what I think. And yes, it doesn't matter how you vote. That's why I've, for years I actually stopped voting. And I seldom vote now. Okay. Well, I, you know, I'm ever hopeful in terms of the democratic process, so I continue to vote. And as I say, my major concern about the, uh, about the Kinder Morgan is that uh, if it is rescinded, then uh, other problems are going to arise to take its place. But I think, I mean, what I'd, like, what I'd like to see us do is move towards the future economy, which is not pipelines. I mean, Alberta has been poisoned by this industry. The, the amount of poisoning they've done to Alberta is probably incalculable. And, it's, and they've got these literally tens of thousands of wells that are basically, you can't turn them off, right? Unless you, I mean, really, you can't turn them off, so. In terms of decommissioning them? Yeah, yeah. Or, or it's, it's expensive to the nth degree. I mean, we've, I mean, poor Alberta, so at least we should stop you know the doing of more and start towards something yeah. less insane i agree that we have to stop doing uh what the and but that was part of the pan canadian agreement okay i mean you talk about the oil sands they're going to put a, a hundred megaton per year cap on the oil sands now should it be 50 should it be 40 should it be 30 don't know but at least it's a cap yeah I, I mean, I, I, I see what you're saying. To me, it's more that the people making these decisions are, I don't know, I don't know what, 
what the word to you. They're illegitimate. They're because they got voted into office. They did get voted into office. But when I look at what democracy is supposed to be, and when I see what democracy is in our country, yeah, they get voted into office, but they don't work for us. They lie to us. They don't care about us. And they work for somebody else. So that's not democracy. Um, so I see it all as illegitimate. I, I, I'd like them to just find out, you know, give, give us, on the big issue, start giving us some honest information. Give us facts and figures and numbers, and then find out what we want, and then try to do it. That's what our government should be doing. But instead, they work for corporate Canada, and I don't even fault them, because, you know, if they don't, somebody else will. It's, it's a mess. We need a democratic revolution. That's my Okay. Shtick. So I'll, I'll wait. <laughs> Uh, and, and what you're saying is, before that comes, we've got to make some agreements and get somewhere. Well, yeah. this is the only game in town, right? Yeah. And uh, we, may, we might get a new game in uh, British Columbia, because as you know, there's a uh, referendum that's going to happen uh, next uh, November, I guess. And we're going to apparently get a chance to a mail-in ballot, vote on some form of proportional representation. Um, and the uh, BC government will be actively campaigning on behalf of proportional representation. I don't think we're going to get it. Because? Because it's, it's too important. I think, it, uh, to me, proportional representation is extremely important because it is more democratic. And that's why we haven't been able to get it until now. And that's why they're not going to let us have it now. I don't know what's going to happen. But I know there is a bit of a catch in there in that if the government falls a little bit early, uh, we will maintain the current voting yeah. system. That was one of the details in, in the plan. Right. It's I, almost like a bit, uh, yeah. So. I think what the NDP government wants to do is to make sure that they... It, they're dependent on the Greens not to fall, so they, I guess they just want to get this thing close enough to, uh, you know, a four-year kind of uh, term, um, because otherwise they're in danger of, of uh, you know, losing a vote of confidence. Yeah. Oh, I, w I wanted to say something. Somebody uh, sent me a ballot, which unfortunately I don't have, but it's the ballot they use in Germany, which is a... It's a system that allows you to vote for your own regional, just like we elect our MLAs and MPs in a certain area. They still have that in Germany. Plus, the system is very proportional. And one of the arguments you hear about against using PR voting is that it's difficult. So I don't have the ballot, but I did fill one out just for fun. So let's pretend this is a ballot that I'm going to vote. Done. That's exactly how long it takes to vote in the German system. So you system. get two votes? You have two votes. One for your representative. One for that your goes representative. Off to, the, to the capital. Yes. And represents your interests in your writing. Yes. And, and what's one, the other vote for? The other one is which party would you like to see? Um, so, for example, here in uh, Victoria, I might vote if I had this choice. Who's got a chance to beat the Liberal? That's how I see it. Is it the NDP? Is it the Green? Let's say it's the Green, or let's say it's the NDP. I'll vote NDP. But which party do I want? Well, I want to see the Green Party. So the Green, if the Greens get 15% of the vote in that second thing, they will end up with 15% of the seats in the legislature. Okay. In the last election, they got about 16% of the vote of the votes, but only got three seats. Which they really got pushed down, which is one flaw of our current voting system. It rewards the parties at the top. Why should I get to vote for a party? I mean, I'm, my, I'm first and foremost interested in voting uh, for somebody whose job is to, again, represent the interests of my riding uh, in either Victoria or, uh, or in Ottawa. Uh, so that's what I do and I go out and vote for an individual. I'm just not sure why I should get a second vote for some party. Because a lot of people think that our voting system should be proportional, so that if a party gets 10% of the votes, they get 10% of the seats. In our 
existing system, that never happens. If you get 10% of the votes, you're going to get zero seats forever, which means that the 10% of the population that supports, let's say, the Green Party or any small, you know, there's so many, they don't get a representation. You know, as somebody who supported, you know, I believe the NDP green, dream, but I'd like to see the Greens get in with the votes they get, but they never do. In the last federal election, Elizabeth May was elected. Mm -hmm. It took 600,000 votes to elect her. That's how many votes the Greens got across the country. These are ballpark figures. But it only took about 38,000 votes to elect one Liberal. So 600,000 voters who voted Green got one MP, Elizabeth May, but only 38,000 voters who voted Liberal got an MP. That's the huge difference of the way our old voting system it, it just it just so, destroys mm -hmm. new ideas it doesn't you know as we've seen so where would the if uh, if there was a difference between how many of a particular party's members uh, I'm sorry representatives were elected directly by the majority of people in their uh, in their uh, writing so there's a difference between that number and the number that the party got, right? How, which, where do you find people to make up the difference? Where do they come from? That's a whole different story, and there's different ways of doing it. But let's move on to open houses. Open okay. houses. Just, just, just to talk a bit about the city government, because you and I have been to a lot of open houses. And, I mean, to me it's an insult to the people of the city that our governments run these open houses because it's all only their only their ideas are allowed to be presented. They well, run to, the open house. Well, I know, but you get to put your ideas on little yellow stickers and put them up on the boards. Wouldn't it be better if, for example, there was a debate on a stage and both sides or three sides could present different points of view? Something, something where people, I mean, it really... I've been to a lot of open yeah. houses, as you know, and uh, the design sometimes is frustrating. So there's one coming up, I live in Gonzales, there's a Gonzales neighborhood plan uh, open house uh, coming up on Saturday, and the city's going to come back and show us um, uh, how they've listened to what we've said about the first draft of the plan and some of the changes that they've made. And um, there's going to be two times during the one and a half hour, two hour open house where a representative from the city will get up and do a little, you know, presentation and um, it's at that point in time that you have an opportunity to ask questions and I think that's really important to have a focal to have a focal point at what I get frustrated with are those open houses there are a number on the sewage uh, around times when they you know we had a whole lot, lot of open houses on the sewage uh, issue and you'd go and you have a whole bunch of poster boards and there were staff circulating but there was never a focal point where everybody in the room could listen to um, people in the room ask questions of the, of the others. It was always, it was diffused. And it shouldn't only be asking questions, but the other side should be able to or present. Even, yeah. I mean, it's, that's what I Minimally mean. Minimally, you should be able to ask questions, I think, in a focused way on an individual, on a, you know, a representative from the other side and ask really, really tough questions on stage with everybody listening as opposed to having to approach one of them and having a little back and forth uh, you know in front of a poster board because that way things get really everything you know if, if there's a if there's a really strong concern being expressed it gets diffused it does it isn't given prominence. and that's why they have open houses it, 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 well it depends how you design them plan. I like the idea of having us along with it is you know uh, you know a, a 30 minute debate with uh, two representatives from each side, that would certainly, you know, certainly jazz up the you know, some of the open houses. Anyways, that's 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 what we should have, and, and you know, that's what we should have. We're the citizens, for God's sake. They treat us like how they must laugh at us, you know. Just <laughs> well, we have an election coming up next uh, uh. fall around this time, and you can vote them all. Out. You can cast your vote uh, in favor of uh, a new crowd. 
to me what has to change is where the power is. The power should not be with the, the people we elect. I think the power should be with us. Their job, I, I think, should be to find out what we want and then try to do it. But instead they seem to fall prey to another set of ideas and their job, the city council's job, is to carry out those orders. And I saw them do it where, where in a neighborhood close to where I used to live, where a huge BOSA development was put in that was totally, totally destructive of, of the neighborhood. And the city council just gave BOSA everything they wanted, basically. The neighborhood, it's like... <sighs> well, the, you know, the, I think that vote was... <clears throat> I don't know what the vote was, but it was split vote, yeah. right? There was two or three um, members of counts councillors who voted against the development. And so, you know, again, next time, uh, when the next election comes along, you can turn out and reward those guys. And uh, they just, I don't think they should have the power to do that to, to the people who live. I mean, what they're doing is they're putting up like a superstore size it's big um, supermarket there mm -hmm. and it's going to change traffic patterns and the neighborhood and I'm just not sure city council should have the right to do that when the neighbors absolutely didn't want it they were willing to compromise but there was in the end I don't think much or any compromise that's the way our city is run that's the way our province is run that's the way our government is run the feds to me, that's our problem. And you're going to change this how? I was hoping you had the answer, that's why. <laughs> no, I believe in representative democracy. I'm not a big fan of direct democracy. We, we, we elect individuals, whether it be at the city council level or to go off to Victoria or Ottawa or wherever it is, and represent our interests. They don't. Well, then you vote them out of office next chance you get. We do. <laughs> but but then they don't again. <laughs> a new crowd. <laughs> so I'm just going to stop us right here. Are we out of time? <laughs> yes, we're out of time. John, thank you very much. <laughs> My pleasure. Thanks. And thanks for watching this segment of Citizens Forum. Welcome back. We're going to be talking in this segment about what I think is a very important issue and what I think is something that could uh, benefit a lot of people. Traditional Chinese medicine. Our guest is uh, Dr. Gang Lin Yin, who is the principal? Yeah, principal of Osho College of Acupuncture and Herbology in BC, Victoria. And it's been a college here in Victoria for quite a long time. Yeah, set up since 1999. So, we're going to start off by talking about is Chinese medicine effective? Yeah. It has been for me. Yeah, so uh, traditional Chinese medicine has been proved effective for like a long, long history. So this medicine, more than three or four thousand years history, and has a lot of successful cases. And this medicine has been proved effective recently according to uh, some modern technology, modern research. So this is why WHO, the World Health Organization, and the UN highly recommend uh, acupuncture and the traditional Chinese medicine as a part of uh, medical service to people. You've got a small list of... Uh, of uh, WHO? Yeah, this... I'll, can I? Yeah, please. Yeah. Yeah. This is, uh, this is just a short list of some of the illnesses and health problems that the WHO says have been, you know, proven to Western standards, which I, you know, I don't really, but anyways, you can see it's a fairly, it's a fairly extensive list. And it's, it's probably, it's probably much, there's a third page here, but I won't get it. And it's probably much longer than that. So, can I just ask you about a few specific, like, for example, can, can Chinese medicine 
which includes herbs and acupuncture, you are right. treat pain. Yeah. So traditional Chinese medicine, including herbs and acupuncture, uh, actually is very good to treat pain. Do you know the strongest one to relieve pain is called anesthesia. And actually, acupuncture and herbs can reach another level. And in, in Victoria, I once helped one dentist to do the tooth withdrawal. And we need anesthesia, but unfortunately, the patient sensitive to the modern, like a regular anesthesia medicine. Then the only way, that from alternative way, then I was invited to help the people and with the surgery, the dental surgery, and with the acupuncture, play the job as anesthesia. So they get a very good result without any anesthesia, and we perform the surgery smoothly. So it means the acupuncture is very good. I, actually, I treat a lot of people with their, their very, very severe pain. For example, patients have a disc bulging, hernia, sometimes very pain, they need morphine. I have some patients that even found the ambulance several times, and then they could not get a very good result here. And, but we use acupuncture and herbs successfully conquer the pain without the pain and fix the problem. So acupuncture is very good for pain, and then this one is well known by a lot of people. I know that a lot of people are taking painkillers in our society, so I'm assuming a lot of people are suffering a lot of pain. And if Chinese medicine can help that, then I would like to see it given more of a try. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Uh, Chinese medicine and acupuncture really help them to relieve pain. You know, when they use Western medicine, it's great. Worse is very strong to relieve pain. But uh, unfortunately, sometimes there's a side effect or addiction and they make damage to the body. But if you use acupuncture and herbs, cooperate with it you can significantly reduce the dosage of Western medicine to relieve pain. So also means you can reduce the side effect from Western medicine. And uh, as my uh, experience showed that uh, this one very good. Acupuncture herbs play the job as assistant or, or the supplementary to Western medicine. We can help people and get a rich better result. Means you can reach the goal, relieve pain, and without a lot of side effect. Let's talk about either allergies or skin problems or just one other one other thing. Yeah. So allergy skin problem actually affect affect a lot of Canada, and uh, was is a, is a disease common seen in modern time, and we know in Western medicine and to a lot of people with good result. But some patients maybe result in not gradually, and then they repeatedly repeat the use. And lots of medicine, maybe there's some side effect you cannot use for a long time. And, but uh, you, if you use acupuncture and herbs, you find a good acupuncturist, a good uh, TCM doctors, you can get a very good result. You can fix this problem, and usually with uh, very, very little or even no side effect. And this, we have a lot of very, very successful cases. Um, can you just tell us a bit of your background, which is very interesting? Oh, thank you. Uh, actually, I studied at Tulane Medicine when I was 18 years old after high school. So we went to the uh, University of uh, Traditional Chinese Medicine. So in China, we have two medical systems. One is Traditional Chinese Medicine, another Western Medicine. And uh, actually, the government treated both equally. And that both uh, if have the same right. If you are traditional Chinese medicine doctors, you can practice, uh, make a prescription of Western medicine. And the Western medicine doctor, you can make a prescription of uh, herbal medicine too. So I graduated from over there. And f after five years, and I become doctor. And uh, then I got uh, another three years uh, special training, s similar to the specials. So after graduate, I work in the University of Traditional Chinese Medicine as a teacher, as a clinical doctor. 
So I uh, work as a doctor since 1982. And from now, I work in so many years, treated thousands and thousands of patients. So I once worked in China more than 12 years, and working in Russia four years, working in United States one year, and working the rest of the time working in the Canada. So I feel very happy that I learned this medicine and I bring the happiness and the, to my patients. Uh, also, sometimes I'm very proud of myself uh, because uh, it's me and the all this medicine. I bring uh, happiness or like uh, the hope to a lot of people. For example, I once treated a patient here in Canada, and he came and on the wheelchair. He suffered from a kind of uh, water image disease, so dumb to see. And in Canada, maybe less than 20 cases. And the specialist of Western medicine diagnosed him, gave this diagnosis, and uh, told him he will on the wheelchair for the rest of his life. So when he came to see me, he was uh, on the wheelchair. And he said, oh, this is my rest of my life. But uh, with my treatment, uh, and uh, he could stand there, and he could have a normal life, uh, just like right now, like a normal person. No. The time, from the time I gave him treatment, uh, fix his problem, to now, already five or seven years. And he's still full-time job, no any problem. <laughs> so making me so happy and, uh, yeah. <laughs> How can Chinese medicine be brought more into the mainstream? There's a lot of practitioners in British Columbia, and a lot of them are very busy, so it's already huge. But it seems to me that if the government would put, because what what Chinese medicine can do is it can cure problems. It doesn't treat the symptoms. It fixes the underlying problem. And what's wrong with that? Although I can see the drug companies may think there's a lot wrong with that. But why don't we give it a try? And you and I kind of worked out some numbers. I don't remember what the numbers were, but if like 10,000 people could be given a a $400 voucher as a scientific experiment to go to Chinese practitioners and somebody tracks the results and then we can see something. Yeah, I really think that's a very good idea. So you give us something like a 400 or 500 voucher like this and then let this medicine try. It's not like a try uh, with uh, uh, how to say, just uh, without the papers uh, or with a huge risk. No, this medicine already highly recognized and we know really can help people. So we can let uh, us have opportunity, let our people in British Columbia have opportunity to, sh to try this one. So eventually, I'm sure, I feel confident uh, and our government will save our taxpayers money because this one possibly sig significantly lower the costing of uh, our medical payment. Uh, you know, a loss of medicine, if you use it for a long time, and you have to increase the dosage and make the people addicted, then a lot of problems maybe come from med medication. So if we can use something and can reach the same result and then let them to reduce the dosage a little bit, that's great. For example, you know, when the patient after brain surgery, as usual, maybe they give something called anti seizures. So that medication actually no person can deny said no side effect. Actually that one big side side effect damage the liver, damage the liver function and damage the brain. Some maybe tranquilize too much. So with that dosage it can cause a lot of other problems. But this time if cooperated or you get some like assistance from traditional Chinese medicine, from acupuncture, you can significantly reduce the dosage and you get the same result. You can prevent the seizures happening. So you definitely, you can improve patients' life quality. And if you reduce the dosage, means we can significantly reduce the cost from the government. So to them, the treatment, the fee paid by the government. And if we use, cooperated with herbal acupuncture, 
then you do not need a lot of medication and people maybe not like a dementia or some brain damage come early. So definitely save a lot of money and it was bring a lot of benefits, benefits to our uh, uh, citizens. You wanted to talk for a bit about um, traditional Chinese medicine doctors are, it's, it's tightly regulated like many other professions, for better or for worse. Um, so there is training, there's extensive training. Yeah, so in BC and traditional Chinese medicine and acupuncture uh, have been regulated uh, already about uh, maybe 20 years. And uh, then I think they did a good job. And uh, so their educational system was good. For example, uh, in our school, uh, we have the acupuncture program. So now the program, the students have to finish high school, uh, have to finish two years university level education, then come to the school. Then they have to take a, like a lot of training, you know, just to the one acupuncture, this kind of subject, you need more than 550 hours to get that training. So total this program, three years, and they told more uh, around 2,000 hours. It's a very, very formal training. And they learn not only acupuncture, but also they have to learn some Western medicine, so some basic medical knowledge. So we're trained. And if you get a treatment from licensed acupuncturist, licensed traditional Chinese medicine doctors, usually means your safety were almost guaranteed. And then you always with some result. So it's an opportunity. I hope, I'm sorry, we're out of time. We were going to also talk about the college, the last yeah. issue, but thank you very much. It's a, well, it seems to be an opportunity um, for all of us in many ways. We know there's problems with our healthcare system. Uh, one of the problems is that it doesn't work that well in a lot of cases, and it does have a lot of side effects. Chinese medicine has been around for thousands of years because it works. Um, and so, you know, it wouldn't, uh, for a few million bucks, uh, less than ten million dollars, the provincial government could run a very interesting case study and get lots of people, well, and see what happens. So I hope they consider it. Thank you very much for watching this segment of Citizens Forum. Welcome back. Um, I'd like to thank again our volunteer crew and the Shaw staff that makes this program happen every couple of weeks. I'd like to thank our viewers. I'd like to mention that um, community television is in a bit of trouble. It's disappearing across the country, unfortunately. Uh, Vancouver's gone, Calgary's gone, Edmonton's gone. I think a lot of places back east are gone. Some of the smaller communities are still here. But, Anyways, our guest in this segment is Will Smith. And um, what are we going to start with, Will? Well, I want to have my own round of thanks because I'm, uh, I'm very thankful to be involved in this show and it, it's resulted in a, I've been involved in the show since 2012 since I moved into Fernwood and uh, it's resulted in the most profound change of consciousness I think that I've ever experienced in my life that I can you know that I can remember I guess I might have <laughs> experienced something as a child but it's really been wonderful for me to to uh, see how I can see the world in a different way and see really a, a better world, see a better story about how the world functions instead of the one that I was raised with. Now, I so I wanted to start off by uh, showing you a couple of things. I got this article, this is from the National Post, and it says that US, the United States secretly tested carcinogens in the western area of Western Canada during the Cold War. And then it also mentions that they, um, that they experimented on US citizens too in the United States, which is where I'm from. Children were fed radioactive oatmeal as part of a science club and they were given Mickey Mouse watches and baseball tickets for their continued participation. So obviously I don't need to have, I mean I, I only have a high school education so I'm not qualified for very much, but I can make a judgment on that that that's not good, that it's not a good idea for the government to feed radioactive oatmeal to children. Even I can see that. And so my, my uh, take on that is that there's something, there's something funny going on here because I was, I was educated in high school. We had to take government and we were taught how 
the, the form of government that we experience, which is similar in the United States. It's supposed to be a, a democracy in Canada, too. And I, that just doesn't have anything to do with what I was taught in school as to how a democracy functions, that the government... The radioactive poisoning of children yeah, that the government, the government yeah. that the government can... Uh, that, that it's right, that people would think that it's right. And then I, I, got, another, I got another one. I got an email from a, a man in Vancouver who ha is really, uh, he's really writing a lot about the, the situation with the RCMP and the two people that allegedly uh, tried to blow up the, what, the parliament building with the... Yeah, if everybody remembers that case uh, that happened right here in Victoria, it's actually the only case that I know of that actually went through a full, fair, and honest investigation and trial. And what the judge found at the end of the case was that it was all carried out by the RCMP with the full awareness of the government. And, and of course, the media jumped in and told us the story. But this was the bombing in 2013 um, of the BC legislature on Canada Day, right? The day when all the people are going to be there. And basically, the RCMP engineered, uh, according to the judge, this, uh, this thing. And then for three years after that, the media used that incident to link Muslim Canadians and Muslims around the world to a bombing that had nothing to do with anybody except the RCMP and the, federal, and the Harper government. Yeah, and I, I'm coming in. Bizarre. I, 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 read, I read this, and it, his point is that uh, he says, one has to consider that the RCMP officers were apparently perfectly at ease with the possibility that the two fragile people could have spent the rest of their lives in prison, victims of corrupt police practice. So the thing is, is that that doesn't sound, that doesn't sound like justice to me. And, and, I, and I sort of take... I don't think the the RCMP officers were really perfectly at ease because uh, in one of the shows I can't hear everything exactly, but I think some of them got lawyers because they were concerned. So yes. I I kind of think that all of us are in this position of being sort of trapped in a system that's that's going somewhere, but nobody's really in control of where it's going. And there I would say somebody is in control, but it's sure not yeah, us. So, not, so that's the, the only, the that's really the only issue between the, you know, our difference of opinion is not really, uh, it's just real, it's not <laughs> substantive over the issues, it's just over if, is this beast in control or not? And so what I wanted to bring up today especially was, since I, I don't have a college education, I do remember my high school very well. And one of the classes that I loved more than anything else was Latin class. And we studied, we didn't just study the language, we studied the civilization and the teacher was very animated and he talked about life in Rome and life in ancient Greece and we had to do a, we, we acted a Roman play and we did all sorts of really interesting things to really get a kind of a feel of how this civilization was. And, you know, you hear people say all the time, well, I don't use any of that stuff I learned in high school. And what I, what I would like to say today is this particular thing that I learned in high school I think is very useful right now. And this is, we talked a lot about the word hubris, which is, from, which is a Greek word, and it sort of means arrogance. It sort of means a, a, a toxic arrogance. But in the case of the, the world scene, the political scene, the, the thing I took away from his the teacher's explanation of hubris was that the, the people whom the gods had entrusted to take care of the, the regular people like you and me, the, real, the leaders, the rulers, they had to have a certain amount. They, they would be given a lot, but they had a certain amount of social responsibility. And so when they, when they were exhibiting hubris, that meant that they had overstepped that and they were now no longer caring about the people that they were supposed to be caring for. And so one of the quotations, and this, this quotation was in both Latin and Greek. I remember him bringing it out. And it was, whom the gods wish to destroy, they first make crazy. And the idea that I took away from that was that there's a particular time in history when the rulers kind of go crazy. And that's the sign to the little people that this isn't your fight anymore. 
this is between the gods and these guys because we don't have any ammo. We don't have any money. We don't have any guns. We don't have anything to fight with. All we have is words. We can get on community TV and talk about it. And at the community level, we can do things. So my, my uh, argument is, is we should be spending a lot of time taking care of our basic necessities, which are food, shelter, and community. And so the politics at that very local level, we see sanity. We see people doing, we, we may see them doing some crazy things that are, that are affected by money. Yes, that's true. But we also see them being very responsible to people because they, they have to live here too. And when they're out of office, they're still our neighbors, right? Whereas with somebody at the federal or provincial level, you may never see them again when they're out of office because they're probably off doing something else. So my, my question, my basic question is, why should we engage politically when our leaders are arguably crazy? I mean, some of these things that they're doing are just nuts. We talk about it every show. We talk about, and, and I see the frustration level rising and the, the, the feeling of helplessness and hopelessness. So I think we should just shift from worrying about all these things that are totally out of our control to something at the very, very local level. What do you say to that? I agree. I agree. I think we can, I think we definitely have to work at the local level. But I also think that because, I mean, what I would really like to see is just more democracy, a more democratic system so that the public had a voice in what is going on at the municipal level, at the provincial level, and at the federal level. But we have no voice. We are, and, and I'm talking about, basically I'm talking about the 99% of us. Right. We have no voice. We are completely pushed aside. We've got to take that back because I think now we can say our lives are at risk, I mean, as, as we watch what's going on. Exactly. And the only way we can protect ourselves is to control our government because if somebody else controls our government, namely corporate Canada, which really represents the corporate world, if you take a look at who's in corporate Canada, it's from around the world with some Canadian corporations thrown in. They run our governments, they own the media. If I think if we want to fix ourselves up, that we, we just have to make a more change the rules of the game to make the game more democratic. And we can do that. Okay, well, we, have the, we do have the power. I mean, as humans, we do have the power to change our situation. And, but, but we work in, the, in a domain where it's not very effective. I mean, we have, we have people, I, I've spoken to people who are out in the streets, and some people even want to be violent about you know, demonstrating against corporations or doing things. And I, I just don't agree with that because in the, I've been, a, I've been a, on the board of directors of corporations, I've formed corporations, and in every corporate charter, it says the purpose of the corporation is to increase the value for the shareholders. No corporation ever says the purpose of the corporation is to protect the planet from total destruction or to make people aware that they're part of the biome of the planet and not just uh, don't have the right to destroy it. Or the purpose of the corporation is to help people get healthy. You know, there's, that doesn't, that's, it's not like that. It's just the purpose of the corporation is to increase the value to the shareholders. And the, the original argument was that I've read is that um, at the time when people, the corporations were granted this exemption from social responsibility, uh, the argument was, well, the courts will enforce that social responsibility, but that's not what the courts are doing. The courts are pretending that we don't, we're not part of the biome of the earth, that we act in, independently, and that even if we <laughs> kill all the trees and <laughs> you know, use up everything, that we'll we're still, still gonna be, be fine. On, we'll just fly <laughs> to Mars or something like Elon Musk says, but, but I think that's very short-sighted. So in that case, I think we have to vote with our shovels and we have to get out there and work our gardens and take care of people in the neighborhood. Because that's really the effective vote. And the more, when you vote and you vote and you vote and different people get in, but the same thing happens, eventually that, that uh, gets old. I mean, that's one of the things that makes people crazy, as a matter of fact, is to, to do the same thing over and over and not get any <laughs> different results. But I agree with you 100%. I, I want to see all that stuff happen. Um, but I think we can have a political system that supports that instead of a political system that always seems to be trying to destroy it. 
Well, we have the, well, my point with the, and the last statements was that we have, technically, we have the power to say a co corporations will now consider other things besides profitability. Do you think that's a good idea? <laughs> sure I do. Oh, yeah. I think it's obvious that the corporations have served a purpose. I was in a lawyer's office recently and I read an indenture contract. It was where somebody put themselves in the indentured servitude, the position of being an indentured servant for the, I think it was the Bay Company, the one of the, this you know, the one back, of, uh, this is uh, I hope a few back years. Hundred year, over a hundred years ago, it was all handwritten out. But I realized that this corporation for this person served them a very useful purpose. They wanted to get out of England and come to the new world. So they signed a paper and they said, I'm putting, I'm casting my fate to the wind and this corporation is going to carry me into the new world and if I survive, then I'll be, I'll be in a different place. So, so how long did he have to sign up for? Five years. Okay. So for five years, this person uh, essentially threw themselves into a, a boat that they didn't know where it was going and they, but they did it. And they and they you know they made it. It was an adventure, and you can see how corporations at that time that was a really cool thing to be able to do because the corporation was not uh, human. It, it's it's just a machine. It's a it's a robot. It's a legal robot that does certain things. It's run by humans, but it's not. You know, human. sometimes I'm not sure of that. It, it is almost, interesting when you start yeah. thinking about that. I since I was involved in factory automation. For so many years, I tend to think of contracts now as computer programs that are they are at, to be executed. If this happens, then this will happen. If this, and it's interesting to think of our society. We're sort of in in the middle of out of control computer programs. Only they're not computer programs; they're legal contracts. But all of this could be changed in a heartbeat if we just said you can't do that in a corporation anymore. But what are the odds of that happening? Slim to none, simply because that's the way our system works. So my argument would be, until our system fails, we're not going to see anybody has a real motivation. They're always going to be thinking, you know, I've got a meeting tonight, and I'm going to be making that deal next week. I'm going to be, ma I don't really care. I'm going to be making $100,000 on that next deal. You just, people don't think like that. They think about what their focus, what the, what the programs make them focus on. And that's what our education system does, and that's what our legal system does. But these people, they don't want it. I mean, the people who dropped the, the bombs on the poor people in the middle of Canada during the 50s and poisoned them, and these RCMP guys, they don't really, they don't want to put innocent people in jail for life. Do you believe that? I don't believe no. it. I don't believe it. No, I don't believe it So either. I believe we're kind of in the same boat. We're stuck in a system that we're just, we're headed off the cliff, and if we all just keep pretending everything's okay, we're going to go off the cliff. It's not rocket science. But at the top, people are making decisions. People did make decisions that this uh, RCMP case, these are the people who give the orders to the RCMP. I don't know who they are. They're so high up, you know, they're the people who run the country. They've got nothing to do with the government. Trudeau works for them. Harper worked for them. Our premiers basically all work for them, and they control our city governments one way or another as well. Yeah. And they wanted that case because they wanted to create division and fear and hate in Canada as a diversion, I think, against our real problem, which is the very people who are creating the hate, right? Because I just read that the 86 richest families in Canada have as much wealth as the 11.4 million people at the bottom of the economic ladder. 86 families compared to 11.4 million people. Now, they don't want us thinking about that. What they want us doing is fighting each other in the streets, and that's where they're taking us. Right. And if we can't deal with that, they're basically going to destroy the whole thing. Well, there are, there are a lot of people who are working on a new order, though, that, that really looks a lot better than this one. And it, it just doesn't look the same, and it's not being covered. Uh, one of the, one of the uh, most amazing things that I've become aware of over the past uh, 20 years is the phenomenon of open source or free software. And we don't hear about it much in our North American society because our, we're so focused on uh, 
profit. Uh, but but a lot of in a lot of places they're using free software. And the thing is, is that whole that whole uh, infrastructure is invisible. But free software runs the internet, and free software runs successful companies. Like one of the biggest companies uh, in telecom and uh, combination of Google, Facebook, and uh, Apple. Sort of, uh, it's called Tencent. And it's in China, and they're a huge proponent of open source. They use open source, but you don't hear about that. And they're they're very profitable. I think their bottom line for last year was 2.4 billion dollars or something. I haven't heard much about that. Or Netflix. Netflix uses open source. You might, if you followed Netflix at all, they've been very successful. They hogged the internet's bandwidth for a few years when they first got started. Everybody was watching Netflix, but they took what they did was they said, well, we can solve that by making an open source appliance. And if you have, if you're an internet service provider anywhere in the United States or Canada, uh, and you have a bandwidth problem because of, of Netflix, they'll just give you this piece of hardware and put it in there and it puts the movies that people are watching locally and then streams them locally. And, and that's free, but you don't hear about that. And it's all based on free software. Now free software is based on the idea not of, uh, of competition, but it's I give, therefore I am. And it's cooperation among communities of software developers. I haven't heard a word about that, but it's a huge shift, and and companies, big companies, are using it. As I, as I mentioned, uh, Tencent, but also IBM. Everything, every single thing that IBM now does is based on Linux. It, their servers, their hardware is even designed around the Linux operating system. This is all completely a different paradigm, but we don't hear about it. We, we just, and we're not going to hear about it, Will, because we're out of time. Well, thank you so much. That was very interesting and informative. Thank you for letting me on the show. <laughs> How can I respond to that? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for watching this segment of Citizens Forum.